Hi, and welcome to Different Leaf, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. Pop on your lab coats and your goggles because we're going back to science class this week. This episode, we're going to be learning the essential tips and tricks for how to do at home marijuana infusions. We'll be learning about how to properly extract and infuse the chemicals on cannabis plants into other ingestible materials like oils, butters, and lotions so that we can use them in place of pharmaceuticals for medical issues like pain, inflammation, skin problems, gastrointestinal issues, and much more. Now, if you imagine those close-up photos that you've probably seen of marijuana plants, you'll notice that they have lots of little cloudy stalks on them with mushroom-looking heads. Those stalks are called trichomes, and the cloudy stuff inside the trichomes is the medicine. Trichomes are full of compounds called cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, which all give the plant their different flavors, smells, and effects. And those plant-produced molecules all perfectly mimic the chemicals in our own bodies that maintain overall health. So when we take the plant molecules off the plant and we introduce them into the human bodies, they bind to the receptors in our brains and other organs and help relieve a long list of medical issues, including pain, muscle soreness, and even eczema. So how can we take our cannabis flowers from home and properly remove the medicine from them and then use that medicine to treat ourselves? Today, our guest is Chanel Lindsay, the CEO of Ardent and Billow, two biotech device companies that help consumers more easily and effectively extract and use the medicine in cannabis at home. Chanel's going to tell us about the first essential steps to getting the trichomes and their chemicals off the plant matter and into other mediums that can be used orally, on the skin, and even as suppositories. We'll be talking about some of the common mistakes that you might make trying to do a DIY infusion and we'll chat about how to properly dose and store your homemade tinctures, salves, and food. We'll be right back to chat about at-home infusions with Chanel Lindsay. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to be talking about how to infuse lots of different things for medical reasons. So infusing things actually dates back a really long time. Like humans have been doing this for millions and millions of years. Essentially infusing is just soaking something in a liquid of some form so that you're transferring those elements. So Chanel, what is it that we get from infusing cannabis into things that we can't get from smoking it? Yes, um, infusing is a fantastic method for taking cannabinoids that exist on the plant and pulling them into a useful medium to use in many different ways for people. And what you're getting when you're infusing is the ability to take not only the cannabinoids, but also the terpenes and the other flavonoids and pieces of the plant that really create this full spectrum of therapy and be able to transform that into a variety of different items, right? Uh, Whether it's something that you're taking through um, as an edible or whether that's something that's applied to the skin or something that's taken vaginally or rectally or sublingually underneath the tongue Mm -hmm. is a really fantastic way. But that process of actually moving from those active ingredients being on the plant to being in something that you can use, that is kind of the magic of infusion. And it is a process that you need to do properly, right? Because in that transfer of material from the plant into that medium, there are definitely things that can go wrong, right? That Mm -hmm. can lead you to having a product that isn't what you expected. And I think the goal with any plant infusion, especially a cannabis infusion, is to get the absolute most that you possibly can and to not have any waste. And that was definitely a key mission when we were making products at Ardent to make sure that that process of infusion was not only easy, but also incredibly effective. So let's talk about how people infuse and some of those common mistakes that folks make, because it's definitely not easy. It's like a little science project that you get to do, but like you probably remember from science class as a kid, you can definitely mess those up. So the Ardent, which I have one of these machines, and it's just the most incredible, easy little thing to use. 
and it helps you to change the cannabis bud itself from one state that would not get you high to another state that would get you high. Can you tell us about decarboxylation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me, this was really a a mission of self-healing. When I first kind of started this whole process and understanding about infusion and decarboxylation, and this was over 20 years ago at this point when I was starting this journey. And I think that just to start off, and for me, it was treating my own ovarian cyst that I got after my son was born and thinking, how do I, you know, turn this from something that's fun and relaxing for me to use cannabis into something that really is a very clear medical focus for how do I relieve pain and inflammation and how do I get to a better state of feeling instead of having to rely on pharmaceuticals. And Mm so it can become very important for people in a very stressful time, right? Like people might be approaching and using cannabis and making these products at a time where they're worried and afraid about their health. And so Again, really important to be able to understand what this process entails and then make that process easy. So before you even get to the step of infusing, there's this first fundamental step that's called decarboxylation. And this decarboxylation step is important whether you're going to move on and infuse your cannabis or whether you're going to just activate it and eat it directly or straight. But decarboxylation, and it's kind of a sciencey word, but we call it decarb for short. Yeah. And really what it is, is this fundamental process of taking this inert or inactive cannabinoids, right, and turning them into the THC and the CBD that we're looking for. So what a lot of people don't realize and know is that THC, CBD, they don't really occur naturally in the plant. They're actually in this acidic form, So they're there, but they're in an acid form. So for THC, it's THCA. And for CBD, it's CBDA. So any of the acid forms of the cannabinoids have that A on the end. And when Mm. I say they're inactive and an inert, people do find benefit from them, but it's much more in a, I kind of think of them as vitamins, right? THCA or CBDA. But their molecular structure is such that they do not attach to our cannabinoid receptors in the Mm -hmm. same way that the active THC or CBD do. And if you're looking at a lot of these like medical journals or testing that's done for people for various illnesses around using cannabinoids, you'll notice that they almost always are using the active THC, CBD, Hmm. right? right? Those are very, very powerful. And what they do is that they perfectly attach to our cannabinoid receptors so that we're getting the therapy that we're looking for. So it's really important to have active product inside your cannabis, but the only way to do that is through this decarboxylation process. So if you imagine your little THC molecule, it has a little, an extra piece on it, and that's this acid piece, same thing with CBD. And what you're trying to do in decarboxylation is just remove, gently remove that acid molecule without hurting the underlying THC or CBD. And that's the tricky part of properly fully removing that acid molecule without destroying the underlying THC. And so that process happens through heat. And sometimes it happens naturally, like if you're smoking a joint, that's why that's why when you think about using cannabis, every method of using cannabis has some heat involved in it. And Mm. that's because it's trying to have that decarboxylation happen. So when you're smoking a joint, that joint on the end is really just like burning everything in its path, right? You're not really getting the, it's it's too hot. But as you're inhaling, what's happening is some of that cannabis is converting and decarboxylating as you're smoking it. Into the smoke. Yes, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Into the smoke. But when you're smoking a joint, say you roll one joint and use one gram of flour and say that flour, you get it from the dispensary and it has 20% THC, it says on the back or 20% THCA, that bud of cannabis flower actually has 200 milligrams of potential THC in it. 200, that's a lot. When you think about buying a 200 milligram edible, right? Here in Massachusetts, you'd have to buy two separate edibles in order to get up to that 200 mark. But that's what exists in like every gram of cannabis. But when you're smoking it, you're destroying a ton of that THC. Smoking is probably one of the most inefficient ways to use cannabis because you're just burning it all up. Yes, but if you are really smart and thoughtful about the way that you activate that, you can get 200 plus milligrams out of every gram. And that's definitely something that blows people's minds. They don't realize actually that you need very little to make different products if you're doing the process right. 
And so the traditional ways of decarboxylating were putting it in the oven, putting it in a toaster oven, putting it in the crock pot. And that's personally what I did for 10 years when I was first making cannabis edibles. But those processes are not really tight when it comes to time and temperature. And when I say tight, I'm talking about the difference between one degree in a couple of minutes, you know, making a difference between whether you're getting 70 percent out of that, you know, oh, like 100 milligrams or whether you're getting that 200 milligrams, right? Wow, just that one degree difference and just a little space and time, like five minutes can make that much difference to, to what you get to extract from it. Exactly. And so it's mm. really important. And, and it, when I first was doing testing, when I was developing Arden, um, I saw this firsthand because it was early days in Massachusetts and people were trying to make their product. And I was um, working with MCR labs and testing out my product and basically honing in on those right time and temperature, you know, profiles and not just the time and temperature profiles, because you can try to do that in the oven. But the fact that it actually had to be so tight in lab grade that there really wasn't any fluctuation. Like in your oven, you're fluctuating 10, 20 degrees. You know, it's not a it's not a scientific device. And really, decarb is a scientific process. But if you do it correctly with this right amount of heat for the right amount of time. And when I developed Arden, I made sure there were two sensors in the device. So there's one on the side of the unit where the heating element is to make sure it doesn't go too high. But there's also a sensor embedded in the bottom of the unit to make sure that even the cannabis in the very middle is getting to that right temperature, right? Whoa. So it's a very, very precise heating algorithm and heating cycles to make sure that everything is getting right to that temperature threshold so that that conversion of removing that acid molecule can happen and you can be left with the maximum amount of THC or CBD or whatever is in there. And there are so many different wonderful cannabinoids, whether a THCV is becoming very popular mm -hmm. and, and THCV has an A at it too, right? It has a THCVA, you know, when you're buying that flower raw. And so, and in my opinion, especially with those minor cannabinoids, you have to be very careful when you're decarbing them because there's not a lot of them in there to begin with. Right. So you really want to make sure that you're preserving your therapy and your medicine. And then after the decarb process comes that infusion step. So let's step back just quickly to a word that you said earlier, which is full spectrum. And yeah. that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about not trying to overheat and you're ruining those minor cannabinoids. When you have a full spectrum extract, it really means that you get to pull every little element out of the plant and get that to infuse into your medium. So it's incredibly important to make sure that it's that exact heat and exact time and that it's sort of, it, you know, you don't open the pressure cooker or, you know, you don't disturb it while it's decarbing. What do people do if they don't have one of these incredible machines like an Arden? Can they just use a crock pot and time it and temperature it and will it lose any of those minor cannabinoids still? Yeah. So and, and full stress spectrum is a super important. I always suggest to people, and this is why, you know, another mission of Arden is to make it very easy for people to use the raw plant flower and or keef or concentrate to make their products. Because what I, I am not a fan of distillate. So mm. distillate, it's only just the THC or the CBD, and it doesn't have any of those other terpenes, the minor cannabinoids. And all of those work together in what's called the entourage effect, which means that THC works better when it comes in contact with CBD and the other minor cannabinoids. It works better for you when you also have the terpenes and the other blends. And that's why people do seek out specific strains of cannabis. When you really right. think about it, I think about the cannabinoids as kind of like the engine of the car, right? What is that? Is it THC? Is it CBD? And then the terpenes are kind of like the body of the car, like the style, right? Mm -hmm. And so... You have this kind of very powerful engine, but you have different strains that have different characteristics that can make that therapy feel different. And absolutely, if people, of course, we love when people have the ability to have an incredibly precise device where they're getting, you know, 97% activation, and that's what you're getting with Ardent. If you don't have one of our devices, absolutely, when you are using either your crock pot or your oven, just making sure that you are very, very careful and not opening the um, unit while it's working and that you're really timing and making sure that, that you are watching or even having a thermometer in there with it to just try as much as you can to keep that process as, as tight as possible. At the end of the day, you still will lose some of those cannabinoids, but you can with a, uh, you know, an oven decarb, 
get up to 70%. You're doing it the right way. So it's not like you're losing everything, but certainly our goal was to make it be able to stretch your stash as far as possible and then make it simple too. One of the challenges that I had when I was first making cannabis product was the smell Mm -hmm. and making sure that that smell was contained. And that can be a challenge when you're using the oven. And so just being discreet is certainly really important for folks. And just being easy, like a, a one button press touch. And that's what we found too, is that As I mentioned, a lot of people, a lot of our customers come to us in their biggest time of need where there's a lot going on, right? They may have just gotten a diagnosis or be really trying. A lot of people, as you know, turn to cannabis as a last resort, even though it should be first uh, on the front line because of the medical community and some of the stigma around it. Sometimes it is the last thing that people are trying. And by that time, they are tired and they are exhausted and they just want Mm. something they just want it to be very easy and they really want that to know that they have the confidence and the comfort of nothing's going to go wrong. And so I think that infusing and decarbing are certainly the tools that people need in their toolkit to be able to then go and make any product. Because once you know how to do that activation and the decarb, the sky's the limit. Really, you can take any product that you've seen on a dispensary shelf or that you've thought of in your mind and deconstruct that in the home and make that product, whether that's capsules or suppositories or any number of food products or any number of topicals or transdermal products. It really is amazing the ability to make cannabis products. A lot of people are intimidated by it, but it really doesn't have to be that way at all. Let's talk about some of the things that folks can make once you have that decarbed bud. You mentioned like tinctures and salves and oils and lotions and teas, there's butters. What do you do with this actual bud? Because it feels a little crispy once you've decarbed it. Do you just, is it, you put it in a pot or a pan and you sort of let it melt into any of those different substances or is it different? Because I would assume that it's a little different for infusing it into like a lotion versus a butter or a milk or like what are the differences? Yeah. So when I decarb, the first thing that I do before I even move to infusing is I throw a bunch of it into capsules. Oh. That is the the first fastest, easiest. We call it when you just take the uh, bud right when it comes out. And again, whether it's THC bud or CBD bud or CBG flower, The beauty of it is you can decarb them and you can actually make your own customized blends of that flower. So say you wanted a one-to-one THC and CBD. Instead of finding a one-to-one flower, you could find a THC flower, decarb that, a CBD flower, decarb that, and then blend those together. So smart. Yeah. So I get zero capsules or zero, zero capsules and just take that bud and you can actually weigh it out. And by that weight, you can know how many milligrams are in there, right? It's just a simple math calculation after you decarb. And that's the other benefit of precision decarb is when you're doing it and you know that you're activating it fully, it's easy to back into what that dose is, even from the raw natural plant, right? And so if we go back to our example of that 20% THC, so if you're getting cannabis from the dispensary, you can look right on the back and see what the THC percentage is. And then when it comes out, you can weigh that out, right? And so if you were looking for 50 milligrams, you would just weigh out 0.25, a quarter of a gram, and that would have the 50 milligrams. And so stuffing it into capsules is fantastic because you're not tasting any cannabis whatsoever. And you can kind of quickly and easily just like pack up your 30 capsules for the month. And there you go. And you haven't even had to do kind of a second step of infusion. But if you do want to have an oil, have a tincture or anything else or a lotion where you don't want the gritty cannabis pieces where that's not practical, the next step would be infusion. And before I move on to infusion, I will plug once again using cannabis directly because when you're talking about using so little, right, like your average person say is using 20 milligrams. So back to our example of that 200 milligram bud. You're talking only about 0.1 of that bud to get that 20 Mm. milligrams. So taking that and sprinkling it on your salad or putting that in your spaghetti or something, you're never even going to taste it, right? You're going to, often I just like put it in the spoon, just swallow it down with the rest of my food. 
And so that's just like that some can be seasoning a really, on your food. Yes, right? exactly. A little bit on pizza or whatever. And and yeah. again, with it being so small, you're really not tasting that. And so we call that the instant edible method to mm-hmm. really just cut out a, a step for people. But as you know, cannabis is so personal, right? How people use mm-hmm. it, the type that they use, it can be very ritualistic for people, right? There are people that love capsules and they love instant edibles. And then there are people that are like, oh, I would never do that. I really need my infusion. I need my oil. And like we were just saying, sometimes it's a practical thing, right? Like you can't take the ground up bud and put it in a topical, right? Right. Unless you're just, you know, putting it on and putting a bandage over it and having it sit there like a poultice. But if you are actually wanting to make like a transdermal where you want that THC and CBD to be absorbed into the skin, you absolutely need to make a topical and you need to infuse. And so the next part of infusion, the infusion part is actually pretty easy compared to the decarbs. That is the silver lining here is that there is a much, much broader time and temperature framework for good infusion than there is for decarb. So if we were talking about the decarb and how it has to be one degree or you're one degree off and five minutes off, you're, you know, not getting a great result. Infusion is much more forgiving than that. Nice. Thank goodness, because (laughs) I'm not so good at the science. (laughs) But infusion is just as simple as taking your decarb cannabis and you always decarb first. That is one big misconception that people have. They're like, oh, well, if I'm heating it up in the oil, then that will do the decarb. Er, No, that's Mm -hmm. a big, big no. The decarb is very separate. And what we find is actually the oil can almost act as an insulator sometimes. And actually, you won't get a full decarb if you do it that way. And so you'll end up with something that has a little bit decarb, but mostly is not is THC or THCA. And often people will try that and they're like, well, I didn't get the result I was looking for. And you see the test the results and it's like it all wrong. still the decarb. Exactly. There yeah. wasn't a decarb happening mm-hmm. there. Or like I mentioned, people will just completely burn off all the THC. So there's nothing to pull into the, right. to the infusion. So... You can see that there are kind of different, a couple of different places where it can go wrong there. But assuming you have a good proper decarb and then are you ready to infuse, what you want to do is take the material and place it. If you're using Ardent, you can place it in the device. If you're using um, a stovetop, you can place it in there. I would definitely suggest if you're doing stovetop and you can to use a double boiler so that you're not heating your material too much. While there's a wider range of acceptable you can still really mess it up by Mm -hmm. heating it too much. So you don't want to be like boiling up your oil. You really want to hit, and infusion can happen at lower temperatures. So you can infuse around 180, you can infuse around 200 degrees, and that will give you a nice infusion. And about 30 to 45 minutes is when you'll start to see most of the cannabinoids have been pulled into the material. And we usually say to infuse around an hour and an hour and 15 minutes to get the full infusions. When you say that you can see it, what what does it look like? I'm sorry, I meant when you look at the testing results, you can see. Yeah, so, so just like with decarb, we did much, much testing on infusion as well, because that was something that people were really questioning. If you go online, you will see people having wildly different opinions on when you and how long you need to infuse. Some folks say that you need to infuse for 12 hours. Some folks will say that you need to infuse for 12 minutes. And uh, we really wanted to figure out, you know, what was the truth there? Yeah. So what we found was that after a half hour, you started to have really, really strong infusion of over 80 percent. And that after about 45 minutes to an hour, you just had really, really strong infusion. And so there's no need to go and infuse for, you know, five hours or longer. You can make that process pretty efficient as well. So I take the decarbed bud and I put it into oil or butter or alcohol. But how much of that oil or butter or whatever medium should I be using? So just taking the material and making sure that your material that you're infusing is fully covered by whatever medium, right? So you want to make sure that you're putting the oil or other fat. You can also infuse into alcohol too. What you want to do is make sure that you're using a high fat or a high alcohol medium in order to infuse. Things like that are water-based are not going to be good to infuse. So I could do like a milk or something like that? Yeah. So what we found was that cream infuses much better than milk does because there's more of a fat there. 
And sure. butter infuses even better than milk, right? So the fattier yeah. you get for the substance, because the cannabinoids actually bind with the fat. Uh -huh. That is what's happening during infusion. So back to our molecular piece, I feel like uh, Mrs. Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus, because <laughs> I wish we could kind of <laughs> go inside the molecules of cannabis. But <laughs> when you're thinking, so now imagine we're back in our decarbed bud. So now we've already changed all of the THCA to THC. And it's sitting there waiting for the oil to come around. And what happens is when the fat in that oil comes, it's able, the THC wants to move into the fat. Mm -hmm. And so if you have something that has no fat in it, for example, like water, it will not yeah. bind with that water. And just to get even a little more cannabis-y and science-y, that's not to say that people don't use water to just shake off those cannabinoids and make ice water hash, right? And so... Water and the pressure of water can push the cannabinoids off of the plant, like if you're shaking it up, right. but they'll all but settle it at the bottom. It, it won't, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. It won't infuse. So that's oh the difference gosh, there. I am learning <laughs> so much. This is fascinating. So you've got to take into account all kinds of things, the time, the temperature, the medium that you're using. There's lots and lots of things that you can probably find out online and figure out through YouTube and sort of trial and error by yourself at home. But when it comes to certain ingredients and certain uses for infusion, you definitely don't want to guess what you're doing. And the first thing that comes to mind with me is suppositories. There is a lot of folks that want to make these at home because they're not really available in many stores or dispensaries. Although they are very useful, a lot of women that I have talked to who use these for like menstrual cramps or anything that's GI related, do you have any sort of tips and tricks for the best ingredients to use for suppositories or, you know, things that we're not putting in our mouths? Yes. And I agree. Suppositories are the unsung heroes of <laughs> cannabis <laughs> products because uh, yeah. they are incredibly useful. They are pretty fast acting as well. And they have a variety of uses, um, not only for, you know, women and all of our, you know, particular issues, but literally anything that's happening in that lower pelvic region, yeah. right? For pain and inflammation there. And I'm really hoping that there is much more adoption of suppositories because I think they're fantastic. So when it comes to suppositories, one of the biggest challenges that I've had in the past is finding the right medium to infuse in to have the best experience with the suppositories. And often you see people um, using coconut oil with suppositories and coconut oil and any oil, because it, all oils are high fat, are great for infusing, right? Mm -hmm. And I d absolutely suggest when people are infusing for food purposes, try out different oils for different things. It's actually really fun to use whatever oil that you would naturally use in a dish and infuse that rather than kind of forcing a coconut oil or forcing an olive oil in there. But when yeah. it comes to suppositories, because you are, you know, placing it in and against your body and that body heat comes into play, when you use a coconut oil, they almost melt, they're almost melting as you're trying to get them in, right? And so yeah. if you use cocoa butter, it has a much higher melting point than coconut oil. And so you're able to handle the suppositories a lot better without it getting on your fingers. And I find it just has a much better experience of feeling like you're not losing out as you're trying to administer. Right. Okay. Well, folks, if you're brave enough to try it at home, let us know how suppositories go. Yes. And I also, you know, when I first started, and in fact, now at Ardent, we have a suppository mold that we're about to launch. And we've had them for a while. Yeah. We just haven't, um, we don't have them up on the website yet. But it is a mold that has 14 little suppositories because one, when we were thinking of bringing a suppository kit to the market, we found that there actually aren't a lot of good suppository molds. And in fact, when mm. I first was using suppositories for my ovarian cysts, I was actually making my suppositories in little gummy bear molds um, and just <laughs> using <clever>. those. <laughs> and hey, they worked, you know, and they were very yeah. cute, but they were a little bit small. And then when we were looking for suppository molds online, they often only had these kind of plasticky ones that are hard to deal with. So we went and created our own suppository mold 
that makes it really easy to fill them and to pop them out. And so can't wait for you to try them and for them to be available for folks as well. Nice. Well, apparently I have to try it. Apparently it's like a really, really good solution to a lot of problems. So finally, let's talk about storing infused products. How long can you store them for? How should you store them? You know, what are some cautionary tales? You've taken a long time to infuse these products. What could make them go bad quickly? Absolutely. You put all of your hard work and product into making these products. And how do you ensure that they are in their tip top shape when you're using them? So first of all, I would say use common sense, right? Do not store your (laughs) cannabis products in any way that you wouldn't store a normal food product. The challenge with oil is oil does go rancid and oil goes rancid quickly. And I think a lot of people, hey, everyone listening out there, if you have olive oil that's been in your closet, in your pantry for more than a year, like it's time to get rid of that, right? And yeah, treat yourself to some new olive oil. Yeah. And what people don't realize is that, you know, the free radicals that are in rancid oil are not good for your health at all. Huh. They really aren't. And they are the precursor to cancer and a number of other things. And And the the difficult part is it's hard for people to really tell when oil has gone rancid and people absolutely use oil that is way past its prime. So I would say that the first thing to do is make sure that you use high quality oil, right? There's a way to understand and look if you're buying oil, you should make sure that the acidity level is not high on that oil that that will show you as it's getting older. So first use good quality product when you're making your products. Second of all, if you can, store them in the fridge, store them in the refrigerator and sorry, in the freezer that will extend their life. The warmer it is, the hotter it is, especially if you live in a warm climate. And it can be a little bit annoying because it can make your materials a little bit thicker when they're cold. Mm -hmm. They don't move as fast. Suppositories in the freezer is perfect because that Mm -hmm. also helps it from melting as you're using it. And in fact, When I was using coconut oil, that was the only way that I could get my suppositories to where they needed to be. It's a little better with with the cocoa butter, but still, that can absolutely extend the shelf life of your product, of your edibles. But don't leave them out in the sun. Don't leave them in hot areas. That's the major piece. And make sure that they're closed in an airtight container because you don't want your material to get moldy either. Just like any other food product, um, there's the ability for mold to develop. So you just want to just treat it carefully and then try to use them up within six months or so. We've done testing on edibles even at about a year and again, properly stored. They're still viable material in there, but fresh is always better. And I think that this is also something that was a big mission for us at Ardent of having people like making sure that there were no minimums. So if you're making product or you're making or you're decarbing or you're infusing in either our Nova or the FX or the new mini, you can actually just take and infuse half a gram at a time, a quarter of a gram. You can infuse one ounce of oil. My go-to is I decarb one ounce of bud and I infuse it into one ounce of oil. And that's like one or two doses for me. And then I do it again the next time because it's just sitting right there on my desk and I press a button and it's not hard. And so um, another way to make sure it's fresh is to just have a good schedule and not make too much so that you're worried about whether it's bad or not. Yeah, that's a very good tip. Try not to overproduce. See how you do first. Try out that recipe and find the one that works for you and then make it more regularly. I love that. Yeah. And then that gives you an opportunity to test out that dose as well and see, do I want it a little bit stronger? Do I want it a little bit, um, you know, do I need to, to dilute my oil a little bit? And there's also something that we call infusion boosting. Now that we're talking about a strength of oil, if you're infusing with flour and you want really, really potent oil, there can be some limits to what you can get, right, based on that flour. When I was talking about infusing and the proper way to infuse, you'll remember we were talking about making sure that the flour was covered with enough oil, right? And yeah. because, it's, and especially if people are using flour that may not be, you know, 30%, maybe their flour, flour is 15% or 20%, and they're looking for a really high dose, there's only so much potency that you can get, right? Like if you have to use Mm -hmm. so much and cover it up and then there's so much in the flour. So one way to get around potency and get a very, very potent product is start with keep or concentrate. So start with a more potent starting material activate that and then put that in. I'll also do a plug for instant edibles with keef and concentrate as well, because once you activate the keef or the concentrate, instead of moving and infusing it, you can put it right in food or right into lotions or whatever and make a really potent product that way. 
But if you don't have access to kefir concentrate, which tend to be two to five times more potent, you know, than plat flour, depending on there, and you're using flour, what you can do is you can do one infusion with the flour. So you put your decarb bud in and do the infusion process, and then you have this oil. Then you can take that same oil and put new decarbed bud inside it, a fresh batch of decarb bud, right. and infuse again to pull more THC and make a more potent oil. But you see how important oh, it is to make sure at that point that you're not, that you're actually doing a good infusion because you, if you did two really high temperature infusions that way, like that really wouldn't be good for your oil. So stick, stick with the low temp infusion and making sure that you're only infusing for like about an hour, an hour and 15 minute max. And then you can go back and add some new fresh decarbed bud and do what we call infusion boosting if you're looking for that more potent experience rather than having to just take more of the oil. Yes, that is such a good tip. That is peak infuser status. <laughs> like, yes, I would if say you're yes. using Keith, <laughs> you know what you're doing. If you're using concentrate, also, again, go low, go slow. Always find your lowest dose first and then build yourself up until you find the dose that really works for you. But that is a pro tip right there. I love it. And I would say, check out our, um, on ardentcannabis.com, we actually did a whole line of testing on infusion boosting to show people what the testing result was after the one gram in the oil, and then what the testing result was after taking that same oil and putting another new fresh decarbed bud in there and see, and basically how far we were able to take that with getting it that right. potent. And then other infusion testing results are in using concentrates and using keef as well. And that's something we really love and think is incredibly important. Just that data, being able, somebody to be able to see, oh, I see. And this is the profile of what it looks like from a scientific point afterwards. And, oh, I see how this, what I'm doing practically, what that means for, you know, the molecules underneath. Mm -hmm. Science. This is so fascinating. Go science. Chanel, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to explain all of this. I wish I could pick your brain for longer. That's going to do it for my 101. I think I'm going to get started on infusion as a, as a first timer and try and make myself some really nice lotion to get me through the cold winter months to keep my skin nice and healthy. Hopefully to stop me breaking out because I break out when it's really, really cold and dry. And then I think I'm going to infuse some tincture and see if that can help me sleep. So I'm stoked to get infusing and thank you so, so much for all these great tips and tricks. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Awesome. Thanks, Different Leaf, and thanks, Britt. I really appreciate it. And everybody out there, keep infusing. You can make it a very easy and simple process, and it absolutely has made a huge difference for me in my life. A big thanks to this week's guest, Chanel Lindsay, the CEO of Ardent and Billow. Next week, we'll be hearing the stories of three medical marijuana patients across the U.S. about what their experience was getting a medical cannabis card in their state, what it costs, and what products they can get in New Hampshire, Texas, and Florida. I am a medical marijuana card holder in New Hampshire. At the time in New Hampshire, we had to select a single dispensary to go to. We couldn't go to any of the dispensaries in the state. My son is a medical cannabis patient through the Texas Compassionate Use Program. We don't have cards, we just have a registry. Uh, he has it for severe epilepsy, lennox Gasto syndrome. I am a Christian conservative mother of two, professional, and a medical marijuana card holder. Just a stone's throw from the state line of Alabama. Be sure to like and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening right now. And you can follow us on social media at Different Leaf. And I'm on social media at Brit the British. Check out differentleaf.com for the new medical marijuana issue of our beautiful magazine. And head over to xdifferentleaf.com to get signed up for our super cool new merch line. That's differentleaf.com and xdifferentleaf.com. <laughs>